Welcome back everybody to another video. Today I'm going to break down how I made this, my kegerator. Alright, so I received a, actually a ton of requests from people to kind of break down how I built this kegerator system here, how I put everything together, and what was my reasoning for doing it. Um, and while there is really a myriad of different kegerator builds on YouTube already and on the internet in general, um, I know a lot of people do kind of just want to see what my take on it is. So figured I'd just give it a shot tonight, so we'll see what we can do here. Before we dive into it though, I do want to make a couple things perfectly clear. First of all, building a kegerator is not cheap. This is an investment. I think it's worth your money, but it is definitely a sizable investment. Uh, this entire build cost me around $1,000 when I put it together. Secondly, I don't have any sort of actual footage of the build because I built it about a year and a half ago before I started getting serious about the channel and um, just didn't really care. And third of all, this is simply a way of doing it. There are a lot of different ways to put together a home draft system. You might have an upright fridge and you might drill lines into that and actually make that into a kegerator or you might have a chest freezer like this one and make it into a keyser or you might have a draft tower set up that you want to have to make it a little bit more elegant. The world is really your oyster in this one because there is a lot of different ways to put together your home draft system, but there's a couple key components that you will need. And what I'm going to do in this video is kind of break down exactly what I did for my kegerator. This is, again, not the be all end all. This is a way. Um, if you want to copy me exactly, I will list every part and every piece in the description box down below. If you want to build this for yourself, um, it will be a step by step guide but I'm gonna do the best I can without actually having archival footage of the build itself. So the first thing you're gonna need in a draft system, well, is kegs. <laughs> the decision to keg is ultimately what spurs most people on to want to build a kegerator or home draft system in general. Kegs drastically simplify the entire brewing process in general, and so much so that I have completely stopped using bottles. The typical home brewer will use a five gallon corny keg, um, and this is a very widely available keg. Uh, kegs are typically not super cheap. Um, they're about a hundred bucks a pop new, um, but you can get a good deal with them if you actually buy pre-owned. Um, a lot of corny kegs that home brewers will use are actually prior soda kegs, and just keeping in mind that piece of the puzzle, make sure you clean them out pretty well because they might still have some residue from soda uh, in there. And obviously a little bit of residual sugar in there is not always a good thing. Uh, so just keep that in mind if you're buying used, you can get a pretty good deal if you do that. Otherwise you can buy new, which is really what I did um, because I just had the, the funding for it. The specific kind of keg that I use is a Torpedo Slimline. And uh, the reason why I use that is A, because my homebrew shop only stocked those, <laughs> and B, it also fits really, really well in my keyser. I have a 7.1 cubic foot chest freezer that I got from Best Buy, I believe. It was actually one of the cheapest ones on the market for the size. Uh, it has lasted me a year and a half with zero issues and was also delivered straight to my house. So it actually works out pretty well. And with these torpedo slimline kegs, I can actually fit five of them in here but I only have four taps. So that gives me the flexibility of, hey, maybe I want to lager a certain beer in a keg, or I want to have a cold water reservoir in there so I might you know, use that for a chilling system or something like that. The next thing you're gonna want is some sort of temperature controller. I use this one, which is very cheap, and I bought on Amazon for like $35. And it has worked fine, again, for a year and a half to control my Keyser's temperature. Uh, this is inherently a freezer, so if you don't have any sort of temperature control, it will just freeze things. We obviously don't want that. A basic temperature controller is all you need. There is really no need to get super fancy here, so long as it can handle the load of a 120 volt circuit and the freezer that plugs into that sort of circuit. So using your controller to maintain temperature, uh, the one thing to note is that the temperature of air in the keyser is not the same as the temperature of liquid in the keyser. So what I suggest doing is getting a cup of water and putting it in the uh, keyser and then sticking the actual temperature probe of whatever temperature controller you use into that liquid. Uh, that will ensure that whatever temperature is being set inside of your keyser is also the same temperature that is being uh, influenced inside of your kegs. The other thing you're going to need is a CO2 tank and regulator. These are typically very easily purchased at your local homebrew shop. 
Um, I basically just went to my homebrew shop and I was like, hey, I want to build a kegerator. Can you get me all the necessary gear? And that's what they did. So <laughs> I have a 10 pound CO2 cylinder and a basic regulator from Kegland. And every time I run out of gas, which is usually every six months, I just go to the homebrew shop, I pay $20, they swap out my empty tank with a full one and put the regulator back on and I come back home, plug it back into my system and I'm happy. And that really is the core of the system. The kegs themselves, a vessel to contain that beer and keep it sanitary. The CO2 tank, a way to carbonate that beer and also push it from the keg into your glass and a temperature controlled space that can keep your beer cold for you. So now at this point, we need to start talking about the nitty gritty details. Um, you're first of all gonna have to make some modifications to your basic chest freezer in order to allow it to actually serve beer from. And the first and most obvious modification that is pretty much universal to most keezers is a collar. And that is what we call the strip of wood that runs around the outside of the top of the keezer. Uh, the strip of wood is there so that we don't drill through the refrigerant lines in the actual keezer itself when we're trying to put together uh, the whole system. Um, you really do need a wood collar here in order to run tap lines through your keyser. All you need to do is go to Home Depot or Lowe's and pick up about 12 feet of a 2x6 uh, lumber. And it doesn't really matter which kind of lumber, just don't spend tons of money and just get basic pressure treated lumber. But do your due diligence to try to find a board that is actually straight, not warped, because that's going to save you a lot of headache time later. Um, and that is going to become your collar. Take that board and cut it up into the dimensions that fit around the actual perimeter of the keezer itself. What I did was take the lid off of the freezer and then set this collar up so that it basically extended the height of the overall vessel by about the, you know, the height of the board. Um, and this allows us to drill our tap lines through the wood instead of through the refrigerants so that we can run those tap lines and serve the beer. Putting it together is very easy. Just pick up a bunch of right angle brackets from Home Depot or Lowe's on the same day you pick up your lumber, and that should help you adjoin all of your corners. There's really no need to get fancy with this stuff. You don't have to do any sort of 45 degree miter cuts. Just put them together in a way that makes sense. You can fill the gaps in with silicone, uh, which will take about you know, a couple hours to set. Putting in that silicone filler helps a lot in terms of retaining the temperature inside of the keezer and keeping your beer cold in the long term. The next thing we need to do is get a one inch spade bit and we will drill in four evenly spaced holes on the collar here in order to actually run our beer shanks through. These holes are gonna be where your taps actually end up being. At this point, now you have your freezer, you have your collar set up, you have your kegs, you have your CO2 tank, and now we're gonna start talking in terms of gas side and liquid side. Gas side is everything that involves getting CO2 from the tank to your kegs, and liquid side is everything that involves getting beer or liquid from your kegs into your glass. So, Starting with the gas side, here is what you need to do. So for the gas side, we have our CO2 cylinder, we have our regulator. The regulator basically ensures that you can vary the pressure coming out of the tank and going into the kegs. However, there is a third piece to this puzzle and that is called the distributor. The distributor is a tool for ensuring that all of your tanks all evenly get the same amount of gas. But typically these distributors have shutoff valves on each individual tank. In its simplest form, the distributor acts as a four-way split. Uh, where it takes a single input from the gas tank and splits it into four equal outputs going to four different kegs. And the next thing you need are four gray or gas side disconnects. These are self-sealing apparatuses that allow you to connect or disconnect to your specific kegs as you need. In order to hook them up to your system of choice, you also need something called swivel nuts. Swivel nuts are basically a hose barb that can screw onto the actual connection of the gas disconnect. And last but certainly not least, we need to talk about tubing. Uh, the, the tubing that carries the gas from the cylinder into the distributor and out into your kegs is gonna be about a quarter inch inner diameter vinyl tubing. And of course, to ensure that you don't have any leaks whatsoever, put a worm clamp on every single connection that you have on the gas side, making sure you crank them down pretty hard just to ensure you don't have any leaks. These are easy enough to find at most hardware stores, but also your local homebrew shop should really carry all this stuff. At that point, you should have a complete system for ensuring you have CO2 distributed into your kegs, and you should be able to vary that pressure as you need it, and shut off or turn on the pressure as you also need it. So now let's talk liquid side. 
So we also just had four gas disconnects to go onto the gas posts of each keg. Well, now you need four liquid disconnects to go on the liquid posts of each keg. The keg has an in post and an out post. Gas goes in, liquid or beer goes out. Uh, and while you pretty much can use both disconnects interchangeably, I wouldn't necessarily advise it. It doesn't always work out super great. The disconnects that are gray are typically gas and the black disconnects are typically liquid. The easy way to think about this is gray for gas and black for beer. So per keg, you're gonna need two disconnects and two swivel nuts. Basically from the keg, your disconnect is connected to the outpost, which is connected to a swivel nut, which has a hose barb on the end. And then that goes to your actual beer dispensing tap. Now the hose that goes from your, your keg to your tap is actually not gonna be quarter inch vinyl. It's gonna be 3 16 inch inner diameter antimicrobial tubing. I say it again, antimicrobial tubing. This is a specially treated tubing that actually will prevent you from getting infections as fast as you otherwise would if you didn't clean your tap lines very frequently. Um, I think more often than not, people don't clean out their kegerator lines and having antimicrobial tubing in there kind of helps make that a little bit more justifiable. Um, not saying you shouldn't clean your tubing, you definitely should, um, but it is a different inner diameter and it does a different kind of tubing, so just keep that in mind. 3 16 inch uh, inner diameter tubing tends to make beer flow a bit better when it's coming out of the tap. Next, we need to break down the actual tap itself. First of all, we have a beer shank. The beer shank is in concept a tube that just runs through whatever medium you're using, whether it's a wall or a kegerator or a bar top. It takes in the line from the keg at one end and at the other end is your actual tap faucet. Um, the beer shank is the path that the beer travels through though. So you need a one inch beer shank. The next thing you're gonna need is some sort of way to connect the beer line to the beer shank. That's sold typically with the beer shank itself. Um, and that is a hose barb that connects to one end of it. And you will connect your 3 16 inch tubing to one end of that with an appropriate worm clamp on that end to secure the tubing. Then beer will flow through there, through the beer shank, into your faucet. Uh, there are a couple different types of taps on the market right now. Um, what I use is called a Perlick tap and it's a slightly more expensive type of tap, but it involves a system of sealing that is not prone to infection versus the other type of tap. Um, I do highly recommend this if you're not a frequent beer drinker. If you're pulling from your kegerator once or twice a night or less, you may probably want this kind of tap because otherwise you could risk uh, infection building up within your draft system, which can obviously make your beer taste like crap. Last but certainly not least are your tap handles. Your tap handles are uh, relatively easy to find. They're also relatively easy to make if you wanted to go, go down that route. It's just a quarter inch thread that screws in on top of your taps themselves. And um, there's a myriad of options out there for tap handles, but they're all the exact same thread, so you can buy whatever you want to make uh, your draft system as personable as you want it. And the last component is, I guess, highly optional, um, but that is a drip tray. They do end up making everything a lot cleaner. The way that I like to mount my drip tray on my keg reader is using uh, neodymium magnets. Um, it is stainless steel and obviously a refrigerator type thing is magnetic so it's easy to put on there and it catches all of the spillage, extra foam, whatever might come out of your draft system uh, without messing up your floor. Now many of you have also noticed that I have a chalkboard type thing on top of my kegerator and that is basically chalk friendly adhesive paper that you can put on most surfaces, very easily bought on Amazon. Um, and I just use that to write down as much as possible about most of my brews. Um, when people come over, I want them to know what they're actually pouring out of the keg. Last but certainly not least, we need to talk about balancing your lines. Um, a lot of people will build their first kegerator and put together their lines and not measure anything and end up pouring a glass of foam and they ask, why the hell is that happening? Well, the answer is kind of complicated. So in a nutshell, the uh, optimum pint is poured through an equation that involves inputs of pressure, temperature, time, altitude above sea level, and length of pouring line. Uh, and those are five different variables going into one equation, which is actually, it makes it very difficult to tell you what you actually need. So instead of telling you what I use, I'm gonna link a calculator in the description, which is going to basically break down what kind of line length you will need. Uh, and you should be able to use that for your own benefit in setting up your own kegerator. However, as a general baseline, I will use about a four foot liquid line 
from the keg to the tap. The tap is situated about five inches above the top of the keg. I serve most of my beers at about eight PSI and I keep it at a temperature of 42 degrees. That should tell you most of what you need to know in order to balance your draft system if you live around sea level. Um, I am at about 100 feet above sea level, so it really should be about the same as sea level. Um, if you live in the mountains, you might have uh, a lot more work to do, so good luck to you. But in a nutshell, that is my draft system. That is everything I have to say about it. Um, I love it. Ever since I started kegging, I never really looked back. So before you jump in, make sure you do your due diligence, check out the other sources, make sure you know what you're getting into. Also make sure you have the cash on hand to do it and it's worth the investment to you and the investment of space as well. Obviously this is not a small thing, but I really do hope it was helpful to you. And if you liked it and you learned something, please hit the like button, but also the subscribe button too. Uh, I will typically upload a grain to glass video where I'm actually making beer and talking about it uh, every two to three weeks. So if you want to check that stuff out, hit that subscribe button. That's the majority of what I do on this channel. Uh, I also have an Instagram, which is down here at the apartment brewer and a Patreon up in the corner here where there's a lot of additional video content. If you want to check that stuff out as well. In the description box, I've also included a list of most of the equipment that I use on the regular to brew with and links to Amazon or other retailers where you can purchase it for yourself if you wish to. Uh, so do check those links out. It is a good way to support my channel. Let me know what you think about the video. I do wish you luck in your own kegerator builds. If you're interested in the subject, let me know if you have any questions. I'll do my best to help out. Look at that. Beer just magically appeared. Anyway, in the meantime, I will catch you guys in the next video. So until then, cheers.